Susanna Galactic bringing you another science presentation. In cosmic geometry, reality is not infinite and there are no infinities. We established that fact in 2022 and continued to expand upon that insight that infinity is an illusion. There is no number for it and there cannot be. One of the discoveries made here at Anagalactic, which is really a rectification or you could say reification of an ancient concept of zero, which was always suspect to the Pythagoreans and the Greeks, that also is an infinity. It's an imaginary number. What we discovered is the illusion of infinity, which is quite convincing as one looks out towards the edge and cannot find the edge of the universe, we give to that a name, infinity. However, it's a wholly unreal concept in terms of measurement. There is no measurement for infinity. In the rise of mathematics, which proved to be so incredibly miraculous for technology that is industry on Earth, including the ability to achieve space travel, all of this is due to linear algebra and the calculus. This is the ability to divide what we consider to be infinity into tiny pieces. That's the differential calculus. The integral calculus is simply the inverse of that to try to get the little tiny extra pieces that either overflow your volume or surface or underestimate and through the method of exhaustion which is over 2,000 years old and probably closer to 3,000 years old, the ability to estimate curvature has become a precision science. The method of exhaustion is not as precise as one would like. And in all the books on calculus dealing with the history of the calculus and the so-called perfection of the calculus, which was thought to have been achieved in the 19th century, the final the final step in the ability to complete the method of exhaustion to precision, which would be proportionality, that has never been achieved because it's a contradiction in logic. Because linear numbers only work with linear separation, curvature is impossible to, to reduce <coughs> to a linear number or indeed to a linear system of any kind. Linear numbers are constrained to be one component numbers. There have been efforts to extend our number system, particularly with complex numbers, which is a two component linear number system, and the two componency gives us immense power in probing the circle and finally the sphere. And in the case of general calculus for industry and technology, any curve, a parabola, hyperbola, or indeed any curve, can be computed to what must be called maximum precision. The, this is linear precision. With the complex numbers, we achieve a much greater degree of precision in computing the circular function. However, it is actually impossible to finally formulate curvature, which we reduce logically enough to its simplest form, the sphere, and then in the projection downward to 2D, the circle, we cannot compute it because it's irrational. 
In other words, when you attempt to get the exact surface value of a circle, we can get a precise number for that, but it's a precise irrational number called tau, 6.28 dot dot dot. And of course, a precise irrational number is the ultimate contradiction. Science doesn't like contradiction. We like precision. Precision, however, is a linear concept thus far. And so the calculus cannot achieve the final goal, which would be a proportionality. A two-component number representing a proportion. Could this actually be composed as, for instance, a complex number, a two-component number? Not precisely due to irrationality, but with a much greater degree of precision due to the use of a two-component number, which gives a much better portrait of curvature for the simple reason that a straight line can only have one number. And if you try to attach one number to a curved line, you can't. It's not rational. It does an, an irrational number in geometry is not a number. In calculus, it has to be considered a number, and so it's forced. And the way this is expressed, this ultimate contradiction of getting geometric precision, which is actually precise, as opposed to numeric precision, which is limited in the way that I just named, there is a gap which has to do with the number system itself. This is irreconcilable. However, two componency did prove to be the key, and that's why complex numbers are used exclusively both in quantum mechanics and in relativistic formulation of space and time and space-time together. This, of course, is a curve. That proved highly successful because of the addition of the circular function through the use of a two-component number, which thereby relates x and y on an exact formula. Now how does that penetrate irrationality? It doesn't. So the real split which is causing really the quantum paradox and our inability to formulate the universe or indeed macro space objects such as the supermassive black hole, these simply cannot be computed geometrically with linear numbers using the linear system which is a one component system. With the addition of the complex conjugate algebra required to get i back out so we can retrieve the linear numbers from complex numbers, since computers cannot express the pseudo number i, we get an ability to be as precise as we want. In, uh, to finish my sentence from earlier, in all the textbooks, indeed in all the uh, fustian, euphuism, the really premature celebration exhibited by relativists such as John Archibald Wheeler, who really waxed poetic, he appeared to have lost his mind, to turn to poetry to describe the beauty of mathematics is a fool's errand and denotes psychosis, a complete split with reality, that a scientist does not use poetry, okay, because it's subjective, but in the celebration, the orgasm 
the absolute orgasm experienced in high-level physics with the level of precision attainable through the calculus and complex numbers. The ability to almost perceive the geometry of the universe is indescribably delicious to them. In order to achieve their level of orgasm, which gives them the ability to preach the absolute truth to the population of the world as if they actually knew is diluted for a very simple reason. You're not using geometry at all. You're trying to force geometry to comply with your needs. That is okay for building things. We've proved that, and, and certainly calculus, the ultimate expression of linear algebra, is the calculus, for the very reason that it's able to get as close as we want to the irrational split between two different forms of reality. Linear reality is artificial. Physi physics discovered that in the 20th century, absolutely. This is part of the problem as well as being part of the solution. That in our effort to understand the brand new universe, which is only a century old from the human perspective, there was no conception whatsoever of a universe a century ago. It's only within the past 100 years, almost exactly, almost to the day, as of this year 2023, July, we're getting close to the anniversary of Edwin Powell Hubble's discovery of galaxies. The scientific, official discovery of the galaxy redounding on us to make us realize that we are in a galaxy, something that was never known such that it could be proved, was then proved. We are in a galaxy because we can now recompute stellar magnitude throughout the galaxy in terms of a portrait of our galaxy, which is Andromeda, our nearest neighbor in the galactic realm. Now all of this is a thumbnail sketch to bring us up to speed of where physics is at, where cosmology is at. We're in a very fast-paced environment now. There's a lot of excitement. There's been a hyper, hyperbolic growth in technology. We're now able to put men in outer space. There are people in outer space right now circling the Earth. Inconceivable. Uh, I should 50 years ago would be about right. Nobody could go into outer space until beginning about a half a century ago. And now the level of technology is such that we have sent probes all the way to Saturn and beyond. Two of our probes are leaving the heliosphere and one of them is still signaling. It's still running on its radioactive tablets and so it's still sending information back from beyond the heliopause. Unbelievable that uh, two of the pioneer craft have reached the edge of our heliosphere. Our home in the galaxy is a bubble. So we have a tremendous amount of excitement, um, wonder, awe, None of this is bad, of course. In science, we do need to maintain an even keel. Because of the nature of our work as scientists, it's never to give a subjective evaluation. Everything that we say has to be absolutely provable which means that you can verify it. That is the nature of science. What's been overlooked conveniently by everybody is that technology is a branch science. 
and its technology that uses calculus. But the main trunk of science is not technology, and the main trunk of science is always geometry. Geometry cannot allow calculus. Calculus is a very, very specific tool for approaching as close as possible to the irrational split between linear space and reality. Linear space is not quite real. That can be quantified. We know virtually exactly, in a nominative sense, what is holding us up from getting an accurate picture of the universe. It is, in fact, the reliance on calculus that is preventing understanding. The human problem with that is the level of commitment by the technologists. These would be your typical paid astrophysicist and quantum mechanist who has a specific job to do. It's not for science in, in the basic sense. It's for a branch science called technology. And there, the calculus reigns supreme. The calculus, by the standards of technology, is absolutely the gift of heaven to earth. It's really the only good game in town. The advent of the Industrial Revolution caused some major changes in the way humans do science. The rise of mathematics is legendary now, and the problems have never gone away, and everybody continues, I mean the astrophysicists, the technologists, continue in their writings to the public to express from their subjective point of view of being total conquerors and absolutely successful, they need to share that for the sake of their industry, which comes down to being paid. You are making a living, basically, from the government. None of this is bad in itself. There's nothing wrong with technology in the scientific sense. There are complications with the nature of how humans organize themselves on Earth. And, of course, that has to do with government agendas, which leads to some pretty depressing prognostication for the world. But it's obvious that science was meant to assist us. It's in no way bad. And technology, being part of science, is so far the maximum good, but is that really what science is after? Yes and no. Because of your frame of reference in terms of your problem that you're trying to solve and the solution that you attain. Were you successful? With technology, we're 100% successful. We can get anything we want with calculus on Earth. Science, however, has a very, very deep-seated root in the human soul and mind. Really, our constitution as humans is divided into two non-confrontational subsystems, one of which is the emotional subsystem, which rules us essentially 99% of the time. We are primarily human. And we feel that. That means emotional. But there is another subsystem which latches to the universe. Emotions don't, except in terms of poetry. Giving praise to whatever you feel deserves praise, either the universe itself or your own self or having seen it, or you could talk about another intelligence, an original intelligence, um, that obviously goes to religion, which again is emotional. Joy, love, these are emotions. 
How far has science gotten in its primary service, which is not technology? It's actually understanding the universe. That really is the reason for the ecstasy, the orgasmic ecstasy, as these technologists rather illegitimately claim to understand the universe. I honestly believe, that is, I believe that these men are not lying. They're not trying to deceive anybody. They're absolutely sure of themselves. But science is a bitch. A real bitch. So I say that emphatically so that you won't think of me as being a bitch. <laughs> I have no desire to bitch against science in any form. I enjoy electricity, and I enjoy jets, and I enjoy electronics, and I very much enjoy photographs from the Huygens craft of Saturn and the James Webb Telescope now penetrating further into the depths of what appears to be endless space. How far have we come in a century in delving the secrets of the universe? Do we in fact understand the universe? We in fact cannot understand the universe with our number system. But that is the only way so far that we've been able to formulate in scientific, propositional, truth, functional language. What is the universe? Of course, this is a huge question. By that, you're referring to everything in the universe, for one thing. Cosmology is generally conceded to deal with the universe as a whole. But that in itself is a contradiction because there's no edge. And therefore, our normal mode of acquiring facts, which is by measurement, breaks down due to the limitations of the linear number system because the universe is spherical. Everything in it obeys spherical principles. And it's very difficult to find linear linearity in the universe. It does exist, but as I proved in 2022, linearity with respect to sphericity has a specific mathematical relationship whereby it can be proved, and I have proved, that linearity itself, linear geometry is what it is, which we've always used, linear geometry, is derivative. It is the calculus derivative system. And so calculus itself is now intuited by mathematicians and cosmologists and indeed quantum mechanists. The calculus, because it is the highest reach of linear algebra, and it attempts to quantify circularity, that is curvature. Because calculus is so extraordinarily successful at doing so, it's extremely easy to overlook what calculus actually teaches us from the method of exhaustion all the way to Weierstrass, and I could name probably another dozen names, including Leibniz and Newton who did not, in the estimation of mathematicians, perfect the calculus that was done later, actually over a century later, by the likes of Weierstrass, a Dedekind, Cantor, and several other prominent names, Cauchy, Cauchy. These men are considered to have perfected the calculus. And even then the story was not over, in the 1960s, further refinements were made, particularly in the delta epsilon definition of the calculus, 
all of which just makes calculus more and more and more precise. But the contrafact that must be borne in mind, very easy to overlook in the throes of orgasm, the ecstasy of mental orgasm, it's very easy to overlook what the calculus actually teaches us. The calculus is a tool, and as a tool, it's effective to the ends that we define, which permit a fudge factor. Geometry does not permit that. And the geometrical view of calculus, the correct view of calculus from the point of view of absolute science, the bottom line in science is geometry. The current formulation of gravity is not very geometrically accessible. The formulation of space-time is completely inaccessible. These are relativistic statements which would be hotly argued by those who believe that the calculus has a achieved geometric precision. That's not true. The calculus teaches us that we cannot achieve geometric precision with linear numbers. There are two ways, at least, of stating what is the boundary or limit and one of them is called the limit, which Leibniz, correctly enough, is said to have emphasized, whereas it's said that Newton emphasized the infinitesimal. Both of those are rather misleading statements, because the calculus is always and ever both of those things, an infinitesimal and a limit. The limit could be said to be more appropriately applied as a definition. That is, the definition of the integral calculus is probably best defined according to the concept of the limit. But the form of calculus that you and I are probably more familiar with is layman is the differential calculus and by very definition its limit is not the same kind of limit as for the integral which is the inverse of the differential but the limit going in results in an infinitesimal the limit going out results in what could be said to be more of a limit but there so closely related, they're actually the same thing. Can we state precisely as geometrically oriented scientists, that is, we're looking for the ultimate truth, the geometric truth, we're not interested in fudge factors. If it's not geometrically precise, we're forced to question, what are you doing with your mathematics? because it's geometrically imprecise and the imprecision is directly statable as the infinitesimal. A very difficult thing to define using the linear system itself to define what is the infinitesimal because the infinitesimal is not linear. It's the separation between linearity and curvature. A generalized statement which might cause you to wonder if I'm being accurate, but let me make this more clear. When a line bends so that if it bends uniformly it makes a circle, well that's no longer straight, but it is perfect. The straight line is perfect we say so. It's axiomatic and it's worked. There's no objection to the perfection of linearity in itself. But can it be used to describe curvature? Einstein proved that it cannot. That is, he proved 
demonstrably. The Einstein field equation is quite a jumble, a massive jumble, and it actually cannot be used effectively. Einstein's field equation for gravity, for gravitational space, would be unsuccessful if it weren't for the rise of supercomputers, because only a supercomputer can compute to the necessary precision to enable space flight and to enable geopositioning. Space flight and geopositioning are overwhelming evidence that linear algebra is a gift. It should cause orgasms. It's worthy of all the ecstasy given to it up to the impenetrable boundary between linear space and circular space expressed as tau. Tau is an irrational number and therefore it is not a geometric number. In geometry, everything has to be exactly balanced. We use the Pythagorean theorem, which relies on orthogonality in linear space in order to get a function on the circle. And you know this is sine, cosine. Sine and cosine are irrational numbers, and they themselves are derived from a calculus extrapolation called an infinite series. When you see the word infinite, you know it's wrong. Once you hit infinity, either going out the big number that's beyond all the numbers, that's infinity in a nutshell. Once you've, in, once you've encountered infinity, you're done. You failed. You can't hit infinity. If there is, and that's why the squiggly S with the number at the bottom and the number at the top, when you see infinity at either one of those positions, you're seeing the boundary between reality and linearity. Linearity is not as real as sphericity. That was proved in physics. So what do we do? How do we get the geometric formulation of cosmic space, whether the entire thing or macroscale objects? This also affects the tiniest things, which are the atom, the nucleus, the proton, and the mathematical interior of the proton has been discovered by a man named Gelman called the quark. The quark. And beyond that, there is nothing because the quark is no longer even a particle. It's a piece of a proton that cannot be isolated neither at CERN nor with any cyclotron, there's no way to get the geometry of a quark. It's a pure mathematical concept. And that in itself is the dividing line. So we have reached the end of our rope and the closest we can get to a mathematical in interpretation of the geometry of the Bohr atom, the spherical thing we call an atom, which is spherically arranged, we cannot measure it, and that's called the quantum limit. It leads to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. When you see the word uncertainty, you're seeing basically a conjugate word for infinity. There are two infinities, as was discovered here at Anagalactic in 2022, and there are exactly two infinities. There's the one at the center, which is defined on the quantum paradoxical limit, and there is the outer infinity, which we call the edge of the universe, which is too big to measure, just as the center is too small to measure, the edge is too big to measure. And so we attempt to use what we've always used to resolve circular and spherical spaces. These are the curvature space. Just basically the whole universe is curved with linearity within it, but the universe itself and 
the major macro scale objects are all spherically oriented. They're not linear. You do see linear components though. For instance, the so-called AGN phenomenon, sometimes called a quasar, shows bipolar jets coming out of what had been a supermassive black hole that's now exploding. That was discovered here at A&E in 2022. So you, you see immediately that there are um, just ambiguities that are innate. Everything we have said about the universe, either in terms of cosmology or light propagation or the force of gravity, all of these are imprecise by definition. It cannot be evaded. But those who are probing the limits get extremely excited because they're so close. It is this closeness that tempts these top-notch scientists, excellent logicians, to commit the most extraordinary sin that, that a scientist can possibly commit, which is stating something that is not proved as if it had been proved. So far, we have not proved anything about cosmic space at macro scale, and we haven't proved anything about cosmic space at micro scale. I've made a big deal out of the fact that both of those limits, the outer and the inner, are the same limit. They're the same limit. It's the infinitesimal difference that always remains when you try to state with mathematics what is the geometry of the universe. Now what we want is the geometry but we only so far have one mathematical system which from the beginning of time to the present moment is linear. It's extremely important to perceive that directly, that the numbers that we use are linear numbers. So all the convergent evidence that we have of not being able to be exact from this direction, not being able to get it exactly right from this direction, all of these directions that we're using to home in on the geometry that we need cannot achieve their goal due to linearity positing an irrational, which means irreconcilable difference between mathematics and reality. And thus we discover that mathematics is, is at fault. This cannot even be believed. It's just inconceivable to these men who are so excited. This is the fulfillment of their life's dream. They believe that it's the fulfillment of the dream of humanity itself that we've achieved nirvana with our mathematics. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's so easy to be distracted by the wonders of technology that our capabilities on earth of achieving anything we want is now open to us. And it just gets better and better every day with each passing year Technology is surging forward with linear algebra and the irrational, irreconcilable, irreducible infinitesimal that represents the separation of reality from mathematics. It's called incommensurability. That what you're trying to measure, we have to measure, In the case of the universe, at the outer or inner limit, the mathematics shows 
its fault. That it can't, it can't make the quantum jump. It can't make the quantum jump from linearity to sphericity. That will never be solved. But that is actually unacceptable to a scientific mind. The Einsteinian frame of reference, which I believe all these men exhibit, they are, they are true to their own hearts, they're true to their own scientific profession, they think. But now I'm the bitch. <laughs> I've come along and fully analyzed to a proper threshold, certainly in my own mind, this would have to be proved in order to be shared scientifically, as you know. But I am certain in my own mind that I have achieved the necessary proofs, which should now be communicated, but that's probably not going to happen. This, this lecture is an attempt to communicate what I've discovered, but what I've discovered is extremely and extraordinarily unwelcome. It's as if Satan is it just is attempting to enter the midst of the holy angels. But I really don't like that role. I'm not a bitch, and I'm certainly not an adversary of anything. That's what the word Satan means, is an adversary. I'm not adverse to anybody or anything. I am actually just as grateful as these scientists are, certainly at least as grateful for the advances of technology and our proximity with the truth. I've claimed that as you, get, as you get proximal to truth, in close proximity to wisdom, it induces a form of euphoria that could easily be called dizziness in the negative sense. That you drop your guard. You want so much to have the answer that getting closer and closer and closer becomes your only goal. Not realizing or refusing to see that you can't achieve your goal. Because along the way you get technology and in fact you do get insight into the universe from these equations. If you're capable of understanding the tools such as sine, cosine, complex numbers and calculus, if you can master those you can get a better, at least, capacity or ability to visualize what's really happening in the universe. John Archibald Wheeler is, in my mind, unquestionably the foremost example of every extreme, both good and bad. But in his book, Gravity and Spacetime, a 250-page book, which I acquired and in process of reading, every page that I read causes me to turn to my notebook to start writing things because of the errors that he makes that are so glaringly obvious. And what makes it almost surreal is his level of ecstasy as he lies. The level of ecstasy exhibited by these men who broadcast what they believe is the ultimate truth. They honestly believe that. As they express it and attempt to explain it, it's obvious that they can't explain it. And as you puzzle over all of these Gedanken experimenting, um, diagrams, various graphs that show the light cone, the quadrature of space-time and the space-like interval, the time-like interval, and what drives John Archibald Wheeler out of his mind with joy is what he calls the space-time continuum. Cont continuum is the word we want to concentrate on now. Because the drawback of of our approach, our mathematical approach to the geometric reality of the universe has two aspects which both actually need to be seen at once or you can't really see how there could be a solution. Remember, 
we are convinced, I am totally convinced, along with these men, that we will get the answer. What they're saying is, is that they have the answer. That is the ultimate sin. You, you can never do that and still call yourself a scientist. You become an anti-scientist. And so John Archibald Wheeler is nothing but a psychotic. And they all are. And this is very unwelcome news. These guys do not wish to have their party interrupted with the truth. They don't want to see the flaw in their system. They want to be considered to be gods. Now, they would deny that, but it's easy to see that that's exactly what they want. They posture themselves that way. I'm sure it's not conscious. They're not trying, they're not trying to usurp the place of God or Christ or the prophets. They're, but they act that way, and it's indistinguishable. They want you to celebrate with them. That is the goal of science, is to get us all to celebrate together with the truth, which we believe is good. It is. It, nothing has changed. But what, what has transpired, while science itself does not change, and the universe does not change, the growth of the human race through the Industrial Revolution into the 20th century, the discovery of quantum mechanics, and the discovery of evidence of the computability of the universe itself, these are the goals. And so they've gotten so close, and they know that they're close, and I agree that they are close. They're so close that you can learn from them. It, none of this is really in vain, but in the parallel growth of geometry and mathematics by the turn of the 20th century around 1900 about the time of Max Planck and very soon Einstein the parallel course of mathematics with geometry split and mathematics shot into hyperspace whereas geometry faltered was neglected, was denied, and then it died. And now there is no geometry left. These men, each and every one of them, would violently disagree with me. Violently disagree with me. And I cannot back down. I am correct, and they are incorrect. And that's a bitch. <laughs> so that's 50 minutes. That's our introduction to our lecture series today, where we're going to talk about the relationship between gravity and light speed. I've bracketed this with a couple of previous lectures, so you know what you're in for. This does get a bit intense. It would have to. This is the ultimate, ultimate secret. The geometry of the universe. Do we know what it is? You could say yes, and you could say no. And in either case, you're incorrect, because now we're talking about superposition. The actual course of science can be expressed as the parallel course of geometry and mathematics. They do go together, because every geometry has a number system. What I discovered that changes the game is a second number system, which sounds preposterous. And so not only will my message be despised and vilified, but it will be called the same name that I give to their form of science. They will pin on me that I'm psychotic. Perhaps we're both psychotic. Perhaps the entire realm of technological scientists with their PhDs, their Nobel laureates, and everything else that goes with their industry, their money, huge amounts of money that they get, I get none. <laughs> well, I think you see we're in for a real ride. Uh, they will say that 
no, there is not a second number system, to the degree that I prove to them that it is another number system, they will have no choice but to hate me violently and attempt to discredit what I've discovered. This is the legacy of science. It's, it's nothing new. I don't feel persecuted, but I, also, I am human and I feel pain as well as pleasure. They're experiencing ecstasy in the name of a lie. I'm experiencing pain because of the truth. We do need this second number system. It's the spherical number system. And it solves the calculus problem. It, it makes the quantum jump to circular and spherical space so that it can be computed with quite a bit to follow because that has to be proved. I've proved the basis. I've got the geometry. I've attached the number system. But I have not yet fully explained the metric. This is something I'm still working out. But without the metric, it's, it seems to be just a parlor game. Now, so far I've proved that the static geometry that is the non-energic, the non-rotating sphere, just the static sphere, pure geometry, just like the line doesn't move. <laughs> the sphere does move. Every sphere in the universe rotates. From the electron, proton, even the photon is said to have spin. Gravity is obviously spherical. And supermassive black holes, the largest known manifestation of gravity is the supermassive black hole. All of this has been computed as closely as possible with linear geometry using the calculus. But the drawback of linear geometry is the infinities that are involved, particularly zero, which is, as I have proved, a linear infinity. Because it represents the ultimate infinitesimal. Now, to make the long story short, so we have food for thought for the next lecture to come, the infinitesimal cannot be reduced to zero. And the man who proved that 250 years ago, approximately, Ruger Josip Boschkovich, proved that the center of real space is not zero. Quantum mechanics has actually discovered that Ruger was right. And that's why Ruger's name is coming back up at top level physics. It's because of his force curve that actually penetrates the quantum. And I'll show you again, as I have in my numerous now 330 some lectures over the past year and a couple of months, I have shown that Ruger actually got the algebraic curve for the quantum, which goes into spooky land, where the limiting factor is no longer the calculus, it's no longer linear algebra. We're in spherical space, the calculus is integrated with the integral numbers that I discovered. No more need for sine cosine or complex numbers or the calculus. But for that to be real, useful, has to be useful, has to be for something. For that to be useful, we have to prove that the calculus and the complex number system and the sine-cosine relationship are actually embedded. I believe that I have proved that. But the proof, which is the proof that's the pudding, is in the metric, which is, what is this useful for? The static sphere using two component number system parameterization results in the instantaneous solution to at least several of the quantum paradoxes to solve them. But what it doesn't do is provide us with the calculations which 
are so close to being precise with the calculus that it's hard to remember that you're not actually achieving your goal because you can't make the quantum jump from the line to the circle. It can't be done with linear algebra. That's tautological, it requires no proof. But there is a proof for it if you need one. The calculus itself is absolutely wrong. It could not be more wrong. It's the attempt of ecstatic, dizzy, virtually psychotically happy physicists getting so close to the answer they can't get the answer because they can't get the geometry because they're not using the right geometry which has its own number system. In the next lecture, we'll attempt to extrapolate on that using visual clues, geo geogebra and geometric algebra and other assists to visualizing and understanding the ultimate paradox of numbers, the ultimate paradox of numbers, which right now separate us from reality. They, they're not helping us get the answer that we want. The answers that we need about the universe are pure geometry. You have to be able to see it. You, you can't using linear algebra. It can't be done because it does not translate to the correct geometry. You have to begin with the correct geometry and that spherical space with the spherical number system which we will attempt to show explains both light speed and the gravitational constant and the electromagnetic charge relationship completely. Electrodynamics, cosmology, and quantum mechanics can be unlocked with the spherical number approach. It's a quantum jump that requires a mind split. More than one actually. I've done it all. I've gone the whole fish ladder sequence. It's now time to communicate it using the tried and true ancient method of pure logic which is pure geometry which all of our top physicists have literally forgotten. And that's why their excitement is very misleading. But in the superposition that we find ourselves in as humans, their ecstasy is real enough. They really feel good about themselves and their mathematics, but they cannot feel good about their geometry because it cannot be understood. That's a tall statement. I stand by it. I know that I have the right answer, and I can see quite clearly every single mistake that they make, which is in everything that they say, is completely misleading. I hope I've explained why I appear to be a bitch, which I'm not, and I'm not an adversary. I'm trying to help. We want the solutions. Our physicists are blocking us from that actively. And if there's anything to say that's accusative, it's that if you're part of that, you're part of the problem, not the solution. This is Anagalactic with the secrets of the universe, now the secret of the universe, which will unlock physics. I hope you stay tuned. Thank you for your patience. It's been one hour. It's 100 degrees out, so you, I hope I don't reveal the fact that I'm sweating copiously. <laughs> stay tuned. Keep looking up. We're coming up on the new moon in about a week. This is August 8th of 2023, a Tuesday. By this time next week, you should be out under the night sky learning geometry from your creator. I will never desist from my insistence that science has proved the existence of your creator. That is a scientific fact. And if you don't believe in God, 
you're in bad shape. So it's time for you to find your God. If you haven't found your God, you can. Go out under the night sky and look up and you will find your God. If, and I won't say if what, because it's up to you. Your problem is your problem. Nobody can help you with your problem. I cannot. If you refuse to help yourself, then nothing will help you. That has some ancient names. Keep looking up and get out under the night sky. You won't regret it. You don't do it enough. None of us do. I don't. Nobody can. We should be out under the night sky every night celebrating reality. That's how you do it. Not with mathematics. But science marches on. I will show you the correct mathematics. Never has been even guessed at. Anagalactic will be right back. Thank you.